I, I thought it was easier to introduce myself than trying to compress my, my biography. Most people want to know how on earth I got involved in looking at aspects of the history of black people in Britain. I'd better define what we mean by black. Um, in the 1950s, it used to mean anybody who was of African, Caribbean, or Asian origin, and by Asian people usually meant the Indian subcontinent. So if you were Chinese or Vietnamese, you wouldn't have been called a black person. That, largely for political reasons, has now changed to some extent. So black people are now people who are of African origins or descent. And people from Bangladesh and India and Pakistan often don't want to be put under that label, but I'm not going to talk to you about the interest in politics in Britain because that's a different ballgame. And it wasn't there when Claudia Jones was there. Now, I am a Jewish Hungarian birth, and most of my family were killed during World War II. And what was left of us eventually emigrated to Australia. I then lived in New Guinea for a little time, which was my introduction to colonialism. Not that I knew that word at the time. You don't learn about such things when you go to school. Um, and it's where I learned about white people's sense of their superiority and how everybody else, no matter who or what they were, was a native. And a native was per se inferior. To me, as a child of the Holocaust, that was completely unacceptable. You know, I sort of convinced myself or grew up or told myself that you couldn't have anything like that again, nor should you have anything like World War II again. You know, I grew up with bombs coming down and buildings being bombed and people being shot into the Danube because then you didn't have to bury them, you know, so you just lined them up along the Danube and ran away and the bodies fell into the water. Um, so I grew up saying, no, nothing like that ever again, you know, and, and you, you just don't behave like that. So New Guinea was was a horrific introduction to racism to me. Um, I then went back to Australia and went to university at night. I had to work during the day. Um, and I got involved in the very beginning of the Aboriginal struggles there. Naturally, I got involved. Um, I then, when I graduated, I stayed for one year and, um, on a research project and then moved to England because I didn't like Australia. And England that I learned about in Australia was a land of milk and honey. You know, it's colonial education and everything in Britain is colonial. Um, and when you arrived, I was by then a, a divorced parent of a young son. You drive up through the county of Kent, where I now live, and it is beautiful. When you crossed into London, you realized that much of London hadn't yet been rebuilt that after the bombings of World War II. And you also look at the, you drive through the working class areas of East London, and I had never seen housing like that. I mean, I lived in a, a very working class area of Sydney when I was a student. That was all I could afford. Um, but I'd never seen that kind of housing. You know, this was the land of milk and honey, the mother country. Um, I then went to teach in schools, um, and I was introduced to racism in the schools, in the teachers' attitudes towards the black pupils. And I was absolutely appalled and disgusted and horrified and, um, and began to teach myself, especially about the, the West Indies, as it was called then, because 
you didn't even know where the West Indies were when you went through schooling and university in Australia. It just didn't exist. So I didn't know where half the kids came from whom I was teaching. Um, then um, I, this was in a primary school. I then went to teach in um, a secondary school where the situation was exactly the same. You know, black kids don't aren't expected to achieve, so you don't have to work very hard teaching them. I was told, as long as you keep them quiet, that's all you have to do. And I thought, what? You know, I mean, you know, I want to get them through education. Completely against this way of looking at the world. But what got me um, interested in, in history um, was that by this time I had spoken with the parents, um, the parents of a lot of the children in the primary school because parents, if they could, came to pick them up from school to take them home. And it was by talking with them, and it was very odd for them, to, for a white teacher to talk to them. Um, they were very friendly and and very good about educating me about the West Indies, including the West Indies' role in World War II. Now, in my secondary school, I'm on playground duty. Are teachers here on playground duty? You know, to keep the peace. Um, so I'm on playground duty, and we had been celebrating VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. And the wars, um, I didn't teach history, so I don't know what the kids were taught. But what was going on in the playground was that there were some white kids um, who were prancing around about all that their parents had done or grandparents to win the war. And by then I knew, though it certainly wasn't in any books, this is the mid-60s, that in fact the West Indies were very much involved in World War II. So was Africa and so was India. And today I would make the argument that without the involvement of the colonies, Britain could no way have won the war. Because the numbers of men and women in the military was enormous. There were over three million Indians, um, something like a quarter of a million Africans. And then if you look at the amount of food that is being shipped from the colonies, to Britain and to feed the military and where did the metals come from and the minerals and the clothing and so on. You take away Britain's colonies, no way, just no way. But, you know, I'm new to all of this there, but I certainly knew that the West Indies had contributed. But the, the West Indian kids in this confrontation didn't know. So it developed into a fight. And I have to go and separate these kids and say, you know. Um, and I then, you know, some things you never forget, I then said to myself that if nobody else has written anything about the West Indian contributions to World War II, then somehow I would get around to write something because black kids had to learn to fight with their knowledge and not with their fists. That's what was in my head. Now, it remained in my head um, until my son grew up and decided that he was not going to go to university. Maybe he had had too hard a time when I was an evening student and working full time. So he wasn't going to go. So I said, right, I can now work part time because a book still had not been written. This is almost 10 years after my confrontation on the playground. So this tells you something about um, the ethics of historians. Um, but I, I was very, I'm sure enough, I had no training in history, so I went to one of my Trinidadian colleagues at the Polytechnic I was working at. Polytechnic's a kind of university. And my friend Colin said, um, do you think it's so important to go ahead and do the research? And I said, oh, no, he said, if you think it's important, you'll find out how to do the research. Just get off. I said, all right, you horror. 
uh, are get on. And that resulted in a book on West Indian contributions to, to World War II. Um, not covering it all. Uh, not covering it all. And I then, in the course of doing that, um, realized um, the ethics of the history of profession in Britain, which is about a white Britain. Um, it's always been white, and perhaps it had some colonies, and maybe the colonies were quite important, but you're looking at Britain, Britain's about white people. Um, so some of us tried to do research on the non-white sections of the British population, because after all, you know, we discovered that Africans <coughs> were, um, with the Roman military some 2,000 years ago. So Africans have been living there a long time. And of course, because of this vast empire, people from the empire came to live in Britain. Some of them came as seamen on the vessels that the British used to trade everywhere and were discharged in Britain, so he couldn't get more work. He settled there. Um, others were military who were discharged. Others came because they were fairly wealthy people and wanted to set up trading relations between their home countries and Britain. So we have had a, a, um, a black, if you forgive me using that word, population for a very long time. But our historians don't want to know. Um, so I thought, well, okay, let me now that I've taught myself how to do history research, let me just get on and do a bit more, and you do a bit more, and then you do a bit more. Um, and that's how I spent the first book came out in 85, so I've been doing this research since, focusing mainly on black political activists, because you have to focus on something, you know, this is huge history to write. Um, and for a while we succeeded in getting the universities to set up, it was very small units, but at least some units to research and teach this history. That's all now, almost all got. We are back to, and of course the present government is pushing even harder uh, to go back to looking at Britain as an all-white country, and preferably looking at the richer men. The women don't matter much. Um, what that has meant over the years that though some people managed to get jobs within these small units within universities, those are now shut down, so my colleagues are jobless, Hakim is jobless, unit's gone, the one in Leeds is gone. Um, and uh, people like me, um, never got into teaching in universities, even though I have published an enormous amount of work. Because it's bad enough to sort of have black people looking at this history. To have white people look at it is in many ways much more unacceptable. That's the way racism works in Britain. And very interestingly, the there are three women who have done, white women who have done research in this area, and none of us are English. And that is to be noted as well. Of the three of us, not one is English. Um, this also means that I don't get research money, so though I have published many books, um, including the one for which you have applied, both for which you have applied, um, there's no research money. That means that none of the books are as good as I would like them to be, because if you can't travel to all the archives around the world, if you can't travel to interview people, which I would have loved to do for the Malcolm X book, you know, I would have loved to go to South Africa and talk with the people who, who, who not to South Africa, to East and West Africa, to talk to the people who he met. You know, but I, there's no money. I did get to the Caribbean. I just fly there from here relatively cheaply if you have friends who find you cheap flights. Um, so I did talk with people in Jamaica and Trinidad where I also have friends who give me a bed to sleep in, you know, because if you have no research money, all of that matters. 
no one gives you a bed, and you have to have that money from somewhere, no, it creates problems. So, Claudia Jones, um, I wrote about because I had met a lot of the West Indians and a few of the Africans who have lived in Britain, say, since World War II, and some of them were quite elderly, and then a man called Peter Blackburn died, uh, and I thought, my goodness me, Claudia Jones, many people mentioned to me, um, but there's no book on, on her work, and if Peter Blackman is dying, that must mean that others are reaching the age where perhaps sometimes due to the hard lives they've led, they're beginning to die, and we'd better bring these people together. So with Colin, who got me in the first place, whose mother was involved with Claudia Jones, um, we invited everybody we could find who had been associated with them to a huge gathering, um, which was then taped um, by the British Library, quite incredible, um, to talk about their memories of Claudia Jones. Uh, we have to do that because Claudia Jones's papers have done it, um, and there's hardly anything about her in our national archives. And as you can imagine when I tell you that she was a member of the Communist Party, she was of course under surveillance all the time. But those papers haven't been released either. So unfortunately, if you go to our National Archives, papers of Claudia are almost non-existent. So who was she? She was a Trinidadian. Um, her family came to the USA. What do you know about her? Do you want this early history? She came to the USA um, after her family had come to settle here with her sisters. Um, her mother died probably from overwork very, very early, so father was left with the children to bring up. Claudia herself had developed tuberculosis and had missed a whole year of school because she was hospitalized. But she did manage to finish school but couldn't get any further education, you know, they're poverty stricken, they're immigrant family. So she does whatever work she can, but she joined the Communist Party and she was clearly an absolutely brilliant woman um, because she rose in the ranks of the party very quickly. And if you read her articles um, in the various Communist Party publications, you'll be amazed. I mean, she makes it very clear that some people need a university education to understand politics and philosophy, and some people just don't, they get there without all that. Um, she is also obviously a fabulous speaker because one of the people I spoke with in New York, a member of the Communist Party, got the senior rank at that time, said, well, we had a grand meeting in Madison Square Gardens, which holds 14,000 people, and you could hear a pin drop when Claudia spoke. She said her magnetism was as if we had four ropes in speak. She was the most magnetic speaker that there was. So Claudia writes, she edits the, part, the newspaper for communist youth. Uh, she rises in the ranks of the party to the second level. She talks about equality and focuses very much on the position of women black women especially, but the position of all women, because all women are being treated pretty badly in the workplace. Then, because of her activism during the McCarthy era, she is put in prison. And her health condition deteriorates, so she's again hospitalized, this time with heart disease. And so she has to be released 10 months not for the, doesn't serve the full year, I think, the 14 months that she was being given for communist activism. And, and 
America wants to get rid of her, she was never given citizenship because she was a member of the Communist Party. We have to question what our democracies and freedoms are about. Uh, and I'm not just talking about America can ask very similar questions of England where I live. Um, the question is now what to do with her. She's a Trinidadian and the Trinidad governor says, I don't want to have her, but she's much too dangerous for not having her in Trinidad. <laughs> Imagine what she could do with her gifts as a speaker. And she's not having her in Trinidad, so Britain has to accept her into Britain. So here is this woman who is ill from the second most senior level within the Communist Party editor of one of their newspapers, somebody who writes for all of their papers, both theoretical and the practical newspapers, who of course, you know, they send letters to the British Communist Party to say, look after her. Um, she is so ill that she, when she comes off the ship, she has to be hospitalized. When she's released from hospital, a wonderful British Communist Party says, we have a job for you. Um, you'll be the typist for the China news agency. Typist for the China news agency. You think that this is a woman senior up there, you know, with all these gifts. And this is about British racism, including the Communist Party. You know, they, they never recognized her. They never wanted to give her a forum at their, their annual conferences. And when she insisted that it was always, you know, she was the last speaker at a forum that didn't deal with the issues that she wanted to deal with at all. And Claudia, who is therefore friendless in Britain, right? Because she thought she would be embraced by the Communist Party. Uh, discovers that the Communist Party doesn't have many black members, but it has this attitude for the black members. Um, so what is she to do? The Communist Party isn't interested in the issue she's interested in. And being the fantastic person that she is, she quickly realizes that the West Indians settled in England are facing a horrific situation in terms of racism. Um, Britain, after the war, encourages the whites to emigrate for various reasons. Um, this means that Britain is left with a fantastic labor shortage. After all, the country's been bombed to smithereens, so it has to rebuild. You know, fantastic shortage of housing, a lot of factories have been bombed and so on. So there's a huge need for labor. But you have to send the whites out. Um, why, you want to know? Um, for two reasons. Communist ideology, it was feared, had spread through some of the military. They can't move them around you know, and spread these fearful policies. Um, the other is that there are a lot of Europeans, like me, emigrating to the colonies. Now, even the white colonies were only seen as producing raw materials. They couldn't manufacture anything in the British colonies. Manufacturing was for Britain. So Australia produced wool and wheat. This was shipped to Britain. Uh, and Britain feared that when us Europeans went there, and if we outnumbered the resident Brits, we might say, well, you know, it's not that difficult to turn the sheep's wool into wool that you turn into pullovers. You know, we know how to do that. Um, we can set up all kinds of manufacturing plants. After all, the Europeans, you know, some of us have those skills and that knowledge and so on. So Britain feared that that their control would be wiped out. 
So they wanted to send out enough Brits to make sure that the British continued outnumbering all the other immigrants. So where are you going to get the cheap labor from? Because the cheaper the labor, the better, right? So you'll go to the black colonies. And it's very simple, and to India, to bring in labor. So labor <coughs> is recruited. There is nothing, there's no conversation sort of with the British population or with the trade unions about bringing in this labor. The existing ideology is that blacks are all savages. So the, t the trade unions, of course, don't want to have anything to do with them because, you know, the old savages can't join them trade union and you haven't got the skills. Uh, white people don't want to let housing to black people. And there are signs up, no dogs, no, no something and no blacks. Yes, no dogs, no Irish, no blacks. You don't like the Irish. I, um, you do get work because that's what you brought in. You know, there is a labor shortage. But no matter what your skills are, you put down at the bottom. So you can come in as a, as a highly trained carpenter, for example, but no, 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 you start at the bottom because you have no skills, because you're a savage. So Claudia looks at this and wonders why people don't get together to protest. Well, I think that's what she does. Um, and what she realizes was that Britain's rule in the Caribbean partly depended, and you might disagree, I don't know, on a, a divide and rule principle. So that someone from Barbados, I think, was senior to everybody else. Um, and the islands were in a sort of hierarchy, and they certainly, from what I gather, didn't talk with each other. Um, and it, because many um, or, for example, people from Barbados emigrated to Trinidad because there was no free land in Barbados at all. It was all carved up among the Europeans, but there were bits of free land in Trinidad, so people went there. Um, they were not exactly welcomed by the other Trinidadians because they were Barbados. And so, so Claudia says, no, you, you have to get together. If you're going to fight the British and what is being put on you, you have to do it by joining together. And she does that by somehow or other raising the money to begin a newspaper, which originally is called West India Gazette. But then she realizes that people from India, an Indian subcontinent, say, are treated not very differently from how West Indians are treated or how Africans are treated. So the West Indian Gazette becomes the West Indian Gazette and Afro-Asian News because she realizes that she has to pull everybody together in order to fight against what the British are imposing on them. And she starts a number of organizations to bring people together absolutely crucial, as you can imagine, you know, if you have a few people from St. Kitts and a few from St. Lucia and more from Jamaica and, you know, you have to get together to fight the overwhelming power um, of Britain. The office of the West Indian Gazette becomes a meeting place and a voice center, that's what everybody told us, and you couldn't do it for all the people to come in there. And she becomes so well known that among the people who visit, for example, was Martin Luther King. So Claudia is known to the British She fought the British in many ways. Um, for example, we had our first post-war lynching. The British don't use the word lynching. As far as I'm concerned, if you're killing somebody just because their skin's a different color from yours and you have no other reason to kill them, you're lynching. Um, you can see why I'm not very popular in Britain. <laughs> Those kinds of fights. Um, anyway, 
you had there was the first lynching of an Antiguan going home late at night. He'd been injured. He'd been up to the hospital to have some bandages put on his hand, and he was just murdered on the streets. Um, police can't find out. Um, except some people saw what was happening from their windows up there. Tell the police. The police find the young whites who did it, but no, there's no evidence. So, um, so Claudia organizes a protest which goes all the way up to Parliament and questions are asked in Parliament. And our Home Secretary, who is in charge of the police, says, well, if that's what the police say, you know, he has talked to the head of the police. He knows what he's talking about and what are all these blacks on about. It's just a black guy who was killed. It doesn't matter. Um, there was, to bring you up to date, an exact repeat of this. Do you know about the murder of Stephen Lawrence? Did that ever come here? Anyway, it's a young guy. Um, going home, he's 18, and he's murdered by a bunch of white guys. Um, again, the police are given the names. Um, they even find some blood, some clothing in the rubbish bins of one of the white guys. They're not guilty, so let go. Stephen Lawrence's parents think differently. After fighting for, now I think about 15, no, ten, after about 10 years of struggle, um, the guys were taken to prison again. Um, but it was decided that the period of time in which you can fight such cases had expired. And, mother still hasn't given up uh, now part of every struggle you could think of as you can imagine when you have been through something like that. Um, the white guys appear to be in and out of prison because the newspapers now take it up on all kinds of small charges, you know, dealing with drugs and that sort of stuff, but not for the murder charge. Anyway, Claudia, that's the kind of thing Claudia did. Um, and organizes massive number of people and public events to discuss these sort of issues and what can be done. She also organizes a march to the U.S. Embassy at the time of your Washington march, because we are all in this together. What that is about is the civil rights in this country, same issue in Britain, so we have to support America. Um, she also, which you might find strange, as, as I did, um, organizes beauty contests <coughs> for women. And when I queried some of the women who were involved with that, um, said to me, Erica, you just don't understand. If you grew up as a black woman, you knew that you could not be beautiful. It was part of what you grew up with. It was only white women, and more specifically white women with blonde hair, but certainly only white women who could ever be So when Claudia said, no, we're beautiful, um, and organized beauty contests, and invited modeling agencies to come along and cheer for people, and suddenly some of these people are given jobs as models, can imagine what that meant. I mean, you know, I'm crying as I'm listening to women now in the 60s describing to me what that meant to them. That suddenly, you know, a woman wants to be beautiful. That's how they grow up. And suddenly, you know, Claudia showed we could be beautiful. It, it was absolutely earth-shaking for me. The other very important thing she did that is alive and well today um, is start carnival. Because all black people are savages, right, and have no culture whatsoever. Might have a few musicians could, you know, be that one, but we have no culture. And Claudia, um, being a Trinidadian, at least would have learned about carnival in Trinidad. So she starts carnival in Britain, 
as a showcase for black music and, and culture. And that is alive and well today, and we have the biggest carnival in the whole of Europe. So she's demonstrating that to the whole world. You know, we must say, look, look, look what we are. Look at what we are. She doesn't give up on her communist politics either, despite how she's treated by the British CP. Her international renown is of a different caliber altogether. So an organization of women in Moscow who must have valued her work with women in the USA very highly asks her to go to Moscow to give some lectures, which she does. And to give you an indication of her health, she's ill again and has to be hospitalized there. She is also asked um, to go to the anti-hydrogen bomb conference in Tokyo, where she goes and calls herself a Trinidadian, which I think also tells you something of what is going on in her mind. You know, she lived so long in the USA, but she's calling herself a Trinidadian now. And goes across to, to China and meets Chowan Lai's wife and falls ill yet again. Um, and in England, she had been really in and out of hospital, and thank goodness we have a National Health Service so that she could be hospitalized without it costing a fortune. Because her own income was from the West Indian Gazette, um, which sometimes was published very inconsistently because not enough copies had been sold to, to publish it monthly, so it comes out two monthly. And then Claudia dies. Um, she dies um, in her, she lives in a rented room. That tells you how little money she had. It's only a room which everybody described to me as being full of books and papers from floor to ceiling. And she was expected to turn up um, to a, a Christmas event, um, but didn't. But the people who were going to host her thought, oh, well, she's probably working with her Claudia. She works around the clock, you know, and, and she likes parties, but she's probably working. So people telling me this, I think, you know, how, how, you know, why didn't we just... Anyway, some house knocks on the door and, and pushes his way in and finds, so I'm told, Claudia sitting up in bed reading dead, um, which is a great way to die, I think. She died much too young. She could have, I think, had an enormous impact had she lived longer on bringing West Indians together to struggle against what's going on in schools, for example, where you still don't learn anything about the West Indies or about the history of black people in Britain. What happened to her papers? You know, I told you, I was told there were papers from floor to ceiling. I don't know if it's somebody from the Communist Party who reported her death. And there's a controversy about when she died. The death certificate says one thing, and I'm told something else by the people I interviewed. And her papers have vanished. They are not with the Communist Party. They deny having them. Most of those papers have now been deposited in an archive. Claudia's papers are not there. And when I asked Communist Party members what they'd done with them, they said, well, what makes you think that we would take her papers? And I said, well, because she was so critical. It's very simple. She was very critical. She remained a member of the party but she was very critical of what you were doing in this country, or rather not doing in this country. And she said that, and she said it out loud. So I could see why you did not want her papers to remain. You know, so that's all I can tell you, I don't know. Uh, her legacy lives on. Uh, the people that we collected and tape recorded, that has been published in a book which is available 
and it's paperback so you can afford to buy it, even though it's from England. Um, and we produce this. This is going to be republished. Um, this is from the Black and Asian Studies Association, which we uh, founded in 1991. Um, and this was a special issue that was produced um, with new material that um, we had collected since the book came out and some memoirs of her by other people who were not at the conference to have been tape recorded. Um, and it's going to be reissued because we had yet more material that people have sent us memoirs. So this will be available probably in six months' time at as low a price as we could possibly make it. But you can pass this around just so you can take a look at Claudia and some of the photographs inside. I'm sorry, there's only one copy, and you will see my editorial scrawlings all over the place. <laughs> and that's that's what I can tell you about Claudia. I wish she was there now, because the conditions in Britain are appalling, and under our present conservative government, they're going to get worse. You know, it's a, similar to what's here, the number of people who are Black, however, defined in the prisons, for example, is totally out of proportion to the numbers in the population. The number of children who don't finish school or get expelled from school is the same. It's the same. It's the same. Well, Britain tries to hide. So we'll have no research done on it. Thank you very much, because we don't want to know. <laughs> Any questions? As I know, some of you have to go at one o'clock, so. Yeah, question. First of all, I want to thank you. I know a little bit about Claudia Jones in the U.S., but all the information on Great Britain is fairly new to me. So thank you for that. I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit more on the racism she faced, sort of comparing the CPUSA with the Communist Party of Great Britain, and the racism she faced in Great Britain within the party, um, or the lack of attention to race work, but, but also what other organizations did she found? Who else did she work with? I'm thinking, you know, London in this time in the 50s, I'm thinking of other folks who were there from um, George Lamming, Cedric Dover, sort of people, who, writers and intellectuals, but also what sort of grassroots um, organizations she worked with. Well, one of the people who has sent us something on Claudia is George Lamming. Um, we don't know. I mean, we only know what the people we gathered together told us. Um, Donald Hines, who, oh, where is Donald? Sorry, I don't even remember which island he's from. Donald came to Britain um, to train as a teacher, but you know, you come with no money, so you need a job. And he became a reporter for the West Indian Gazette. Um, and then had enough money to go and train to be a teacher and is now retired. Um, so Donald is hoping to put more together on Claudia, so we will know more as, as he goes on. The Communist Party here, as I understand it, um, had a reasonably large and very vocal branch with James Ford and, and lots of others um, who were certainly very active in Parliament and, of course, with the Scottsboro case. So Claudia was a part of that. I don't know how the black communists got under the white communists because you know, it's not something I've explored. All I know is that she had lots of black communists that she was working with, so she would have had a large group of friends and colleagues and, and would have felt comfortable um, in all her struggles here. And, and as she was speaking around the country, I presume she was sent from one communist group to another with black members and so on. Um, the British CP, um, at this time, had, uh, I think, two other black members. Um, but the British CP, I mean, they were quite remarkable. They're, I think in the book, perhaps, I quote from Henry Pollitt, from Pollitt, who was the guy running the CP, who thought that colonies were fine after the war, that Britain really needed the colonies. Now, you know, is that communist policy? Um, 
they must have been, because he's the head of the Communist Party. Um, the party was actually sort of told off by Moscow at one time for paying no attention whatsoever to colonies or Black Britons weren't mentioned then. So then they decided to pay some attention to India. Um, so they did have some Indian members within Britain. Now you would think that when they decide that they have to set up branches in India, they will send out the Indian members from London, right? Might speak local languages and, you know. No, they send out some whites. Now, as they must have guessed, um, our equivalent to your CIA, of course, had the Communist Party under surveillance all the time. So you would just guess that maybe they would know the white members by name and face and so on. Um, and that if they send out whites to India, the Indian government would be told because, you know, they would be told that they're on that ship going out to India to set up the Communist Party. Um, and they do get out there and begin to set up a Communist Party, and as soon as they have quite a number of Indian members, they will get a lot <coughs> of people, you know, because they're well known. Um, and to me, that is very racist, that you send out whites to set up the party. Um, and what was even more racist is that then the party collects a lot of money to fight the court case to get the whites out of prison. But I could not find that they did the same for the Indians who were in prison. And when I said this at a, at a communist, at, not a communist party, at, at a conference looking at communism, um, I was asked, was I sure? And I said, well, you know, all I can tell you is what I found in your archives. If you did send money out to aid the Indians who were in prison, it's not in your archives. That's all I can tell you. Um, so that's, you know, that, I mean, George Padmore was, was horrified because of what he learned from German Kenyatta and some of the others in the 1930s that the British party was, was, wasn't interested. They then did set up a sort of totally segregated black unit, which um, was sort of always over there and had nothing to do with the rest of the party. Um, so this this is what Claudius faced. This is what Claudius faced. Um, but I mean, she must have had hopes because she remained a member of the party. Um, to give you an example of, of the white member's attitude, uh, when I find some of the whites who were members at this time, you know, during Claudia's years, um, and I telephone and say, you know, can I come and see you, you know, and they say, oh, who was she? Now, there's no other black woman member. Claudia is somewhat unmistakable. She's as, at least as tall as I am. And everybody described her as being very, very elegant. You know, which she had to be because, you know, she's not tall all the time. So why, you know, why do these whites deny that they knew her? I mean, it was just absolutely extraordinary to me. You know, so, so you know, Claudia should come over from the US. Oh, yes, that's who you mean. And that's for God's sake, you know. Um, so that's, you know, that's my interviews with them. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one, what is your take on Carol Davies' uh, book mm -hmm. that came out? Yeah. And two, there's a documentary that I've seen on YouTube um, somebody posted on there. It was about 30 minutes long by, by, uh, by Claudia Jones. And I was curious how we can possibly get access to that on DVD. That's why I don't know. Um, Joyce's book, I, I think it's fine, but it deals mainly with the USA. 
you know, that was my problem with it, because she had research money, and as I told you, I never get research money. Um, so that was my problem with her book. I wish that she had dealt much more deeply with her time in the UK. Um, there is another book by um, Buzz Johnson, which is really um, just her writings, and again, mainly in the USS. Um, there's a PhD on her, which is mentioned in that thing being handed down. Um, the YouTube stuff, I don't know. Um, in fact, I just looked at it yesterday. I mean, many of us have been in touch. The first carnival, the BBC was there filming. It shows you what sort of influence she had, that you know, she could get the BBC to an event like that. BBC claims that if they filmed it live, it's possible they never kept a copy. But what is crucial is it is possible that they never kept a copy. Um, so, you know, people repeat asking them if, if they've managed to find a copy. Neither have they managed to locate an interview tape with her from the BBC Bristol. There, there are some excerpts of it that's in the documentary. I don't know. So maybe somebody has managed to find at least some of it. Um, but it's, um, you know, I, I think that um, we need some of you from America to come over with an intention to do research there. If nothing else, to shame our university. I mean, isn't it disgraceful that Hakim Ali, who I've known since he was doing his PhD, um, his little unit's been shut down. My other colleague, Carl from Leeds, his unit's been shut down. Liverpool, which has um, uh, a branch of our National Maritime Museum, some of which um, is now devoted to the trade in enslaved Africans. Um, the university there doesn't have a unit, you know. And because Liverpool was the major port for trading in enslaved Africans, and African seamen being discharged from vessels living there for a very, very long time. Do you think somebody in the university would say, well, that might be quite interesting that we see um, I'll tell you something about Britain and the slave trade. Just so I could write down Britain a little more. Um, <laughs> I am not a, a historian of the trade in the slave I began to be told of how Britain would be celebrating Wilberforce. Wilberforce freed the slaves and they passed an act of parliament in 1807 to make trading with slaves illegal. We were the first to do that would be a wonderful. Well, I knew that Britain wasn't the first in any case. Denmark passed an act earlier than that. But that I had found information looking for other things that indicated that um, we can continue its involvement with the trains. So I thought, you know, I'm asking questions, is anybody looking at, oh no, it's Wilberforce. You know, Wilberforce was great. We celebrate Wilberforce and we pass the Act of Parliament. Um, so I wrote a book which is called After Abolition. It came out in 2007. And it says, yes, you passed an Act of Parliament, but you did almost nothing to implement it for the first 40 years. After that, you did some. But the trade continued, and your involvement continued until the 1860s, and then it dropped a little until the trade did stop in the 1880s. And then Britain also celebrates that in 1833, 
passed an act of parliament ending slavery in its colonies. That's what everybody will tell you. We're wonderful. We outlawed slavery in our colonies. Now, if you look at that act of parliament, and not just the first clause, but you read it down to the end, it says, um, we are outlawing slavery in Cape Town, Canada, Ceylon, and yes, the Caribbean islands. But the rest of the empire, not that. And India is specifically excluded. It says, in words of one syllable, India is excluded. <laughs> at that time, there were at least 8 million enslaved Indians in India. I'm not talking of transported Africans. I'm talking of slavery within the Indian system. Some people say it was many more. Now, do any of the Brits, you know, celebrating all of this look at that? No. Do they try to follow up what Eric Williams suggested in a book in 1944, that the Industrial Revolution depended for its finance on slavery and the slave trade? No. So apart from writing that book, I wrote a long article um, for the Northwest Labor History Journal to say the Northwest, which was at that time about the richest part of England, was completely dependent on slavery. It grew so rich on cotton. All the cotton was slave grown. And at that time, Britain was not supposed to have anything to do with slavery. Huh? But it imports the slave grown cotton. And then it exports a lot of the cloth back to the United States, to Brazil and Cuba, where slavery is flourishing and where this cheap cotton is sold. So if you look at the history of that part of England, which includes Liverpool, and you say, well, if the slave trade was supposed to end, how come Liverpool continued to flourish? You know, it, it should have ground to a halt. You know, everything should have stopped. In fact, it not only flourishes, it grows. You say, well, maybe it's to do with the same thing. Um, but nobody else is looking at it. I mean, I would have thought that by now, um, instead of just saying, oh, there's Sherwood books, <laughs> you know, somebody would have either written something to show that I'm wrong, or that if there are people with different politics that expand on what I've written, because, you know, as I've said, what you do with that research money is always limited. No. Well, first of all, I want to thank you again for coming out and give you a round of applause. And, and I'll take the host's uh, privilege of asking the last question. And that is, when you mentioned that you were going to expand on the Claudia Jones uh, pamphlet that's going around, do you have any um, travel plans for returning back to the States to discuss any more on Claudia? Not at the moment, unless you ask me. Okay. Unless you get research money, right? <laughs> oh, I never get research money. I mean, that's been made very clear. <laughs> It, you know, it's a wonderful tactic, right? If, if you don't fund historians, then they're going to stop doing research. So you have to learn to live on next to nothing if you think that the research is more important than having a big car or, you know, the latest clothes or whatever. I don't have a car, I have a bicycle. It gets me around quite well. Mm -hmm. um, Once again, thank you very much. Okay.